Dead America, Low Country, Just Before Dawn. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter 1 Day Zero Plus One 3.32 a.m. Jason Schmidt sat on the back deck of his beachfront house on Hilton Head Island, running a hand over the back of his crew cut and taking in a deep breath. The moon was bright, reflecting off of the waves as they crashed against the shoreline. Jason had been all around the world, into some of the most vile and dangerous places one could imagine. For the better part of a decade, the burly man had been employed by the U.S. Army and dropped into various dangerous situations for very little pay. The last five years, however, had been a lot more profitable once he'd signed up with QXR Group. In the 80s, he would have been called a mercenary or a soldier of fortune. These days, he was simply a military contractor. However, he did like the ring of the mercenary moniker. It made him feel like he was in one of those Arnold or Sly movies from the 80s. Granted, he would have been on the opposite side of those heroes if this were a movie. But he didn't mind that too much. His latest detail by far was his favourite. Instead of organising raids and staring down the worst of the worst as they aimed guns at him, Jason was the top bodyguard for one Theo Atkinson, the man at the head of QXR Group and the one who paid him handsomely to deal with any issues. Sure, there was still an element of danger, especially on overseas trips, but this was not one of those situations. This was a beautiful moonlit night on the beach where he could enjoy the scenery and nurse a cup of hot coffee. The cell phone on the table next to him vibrated. It was unsurprising to get a call at this hour given his line of work. Generally, he just let it go to voicemail which was what he did this time, taking another long sip of his hot brew. A moment later it began to vibrate again. He huffed and picked it up and looked at the screen. Blocked, it said, and he scoffed, tossing it back onto the table. Seconds after the call ended, it started up again, buzzing against the tabletop. Fuck's sakes, he muttered. If I'm going to continue enjoying my evening, I'd better see what this dumbass wants. He picked up the phone and hit the answer button. Theo Atkinson's phone, he greeted, his voice a flat monotone. How can I help you? The voice on the other end sounded aged, his voice deep and gruff. It's Jim. I need to speak to Theo now, he said, and Jason could detect a hint of worry in his tone. Mr. Atkinson is currently sleeping, he drawled. I'll be happy to let him know you... I don't care if he's balls deep in a hooker, Jim snapped. You get him for me now. Jason jutted out his chin, hackles raising. I don't appreciate your tone. I don't give a fuck what you appreciate, Jim snarled. You need to get him for me now, or you're going to die. Who the fuck is this? Jason snapped. I told you, Jim, the man replied, exasperated. I work for General Alvin Harper. Jason sat up straight in his chair, his eyes widening. The general was on the Joint Chiefs. Of course he knew the name. If this call was coming through at this time of night, it was certainly urgent. Yes, sir, please hold, he said, and scrambled from his seat. He rushed into the house, a large two-story structure, and darted up the stairs, barging into the bedroom. Mr. Atkinson, there's a situation, he said loudly. Theo groaned as he shifted in his bed rubbing his eyes as he sat up, sandy blonde hair sticking every which way. It had better be a serious one, or else you're going to find yourself digging out latrines with a teaspoon, he muttered. Sir, it's Jim, Jason said forcefully. Theo snapped awake, his eyes widening, and reached over to flick on the light, reaching for the phone with his other hand. Jason handed it over immediately, and Theo put it to his ear. Jim! It's good to hear from you, he said, forced joviality in his tone. What can I- Before I start talking, Jim cut in quickly. You tell that glorified assistant of yours to secure the house. Do it now. Theo glanced at Jason. Secure the house, now, he demanded, and his subordinate didn't waste any time. 
immediately rushing out of the room to do as he was told. His blood pounded in his ears. Something was going down. Something big. Theo reached for the gun on his nightstand, checking to make sure it was locked and loaded. Jim, what the hell is going on? he asked, cradling the phone in the crook of his shoulder as his mind raced. Is someone coming for me? He made enemies all over the world in his time leading QXR Group, some of whom would have no qualms about striking on American soil. It's worse, Jim replied. The world is about to come crashing down. Theo grunted in frustration. Nukes? Aliens? You're going to have to give me a little more than that, he growled. A few hours ago we became aware of the situation, Jim replied stiffly. A virus from Texas was spreading across the country, highly contagious, and a hundred percent lethal to anyone with A-type blood. When infected, the person becomes gravely ill over the course of a few days before succumbing to the virus. Theo sighed. I appreciate the courtesy call, but I'm good on the blood type, he said. That's good to know, but there's a complication. Jim countered. When someone keels over from the virus, they don't stay down. Theo blinked, stunned for a moment, unsure of what he was supposed to infer from that. He opened his mouth and then closed it again, unable to respond. I'm guessing by your silence you have some questions, Jim said dryly. Theo swallowed hard. More than a few, he admitted. We don't know how or why. But this virus reanimates the dead, Jim explained. And when they get up, these bastards are fast and vicious. Vicious? Theo asked. They're violent? Jim paused for a moment. Yeah, he said. The word zombie has been tossed about up here in D.C. Theo sat there, shaking his head slowly. Zombies? He breathed. I know how it sounds, Jim said quickly. But the situation is serious. Theo pinched the bridge of his nose. How serious are we talking? He asked. The vast majority of the uninfected military are being evacuated from the bases. Jim explained. If they're near a port, they're loading up onto ships. If not, they're being sent to Kansas. Jesus Christ, Theo breathed. How bad is this? Bad enough that there is a serious concern up here that we're not going to survive this. Jim replied his tone leaving no question that he was grave. And I'm not talking about surviving as a nation, he added. I'm talking about surviving as a species. Theo leaned onto his hand, his brain struggling to process the information. So no hope of containing this, I take it? He asked hoarsely. The virus has a 72-hour incubation period, Jim explained. And it was released about 85 hours ago. Most of the major cities with direct flights from Austin are currently seeing sporadic outbreaks. By dawn, they're going to be full-fledged war zones. You have a little bit of insulation where you are, but since Hilton Head has an airport and direct exposure with passengers, you won't have much of one. Theo rubbed his forehead. How long are we talking? You probably have some on the island now, and it's only going to get worse. Jim surmised. Also, be aware... Bites might be infectious, too. We don't have firm confirmation on this yet, but we're acting under this assumption. Understood, Theo said, all traces of his exhaustion completely gone. He had a feeling there wouldn't be much sleep in the near future. So, the million-dollar question, what now? I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for you, my friend, Jim replied sullenly. The military is pulling out from the Buford base. So you'll have the run of the place. If your men want transport out, I can arrange it on the ships leaving from Charleston. Just know if you do, you won't be autonomous any longer. Theo sighed. You know me, he drawled. Not really a fan of taking orders anymore. I figured as much, Jim replied with a chuckle. But I wouldn't be doing my due diligence as a friend if I didn't at least offer it to you. Theo nodded. It is appreciated he said sincerely. So, any idea what you're going to do? Jim asked. The leader of QXR group straightened. We're going to turn this island into a fortress, he declared. One bridge on and off, so this is the perfect place to be holed up. I wish you the best of luck, then, 
Jim said. I'm going to be limited as to what I can do going forward, but if I have any relevant information, I will do my best to pass it along. Theo took a deep breath. You've done more than enough with this one call, he said honestly, giving us a chance to get this thing under control. You worry about yourself and getting someplace safe. We're already en route to a secure location, and I'm surrounded by enough firepower to take over a mid-sized town, Jim admitted. I'll be fine. You stay safe, and I'll be in touch. Theo said goodbye and ended the call, his hand falling to his lap. He stared at the blank phone screen in shock for a moment, and then Jason came back into the room. Downstairs is secure, sir, Jason said. Nobody is getting in without us knowing about it. He paused at the defeated look on his leader's face, and his brow furrowed. Is it that bad, sir? Afraid so, Theo replied, taking a deep breath. Afraid so. Jason straightened. What's the play? Theo contemplated for a moment and then checked his watch. It wasn't quite four in the morning and he mentally counted off time before speaking. We need to get to Harbour Town, he said, other side of the island, but it's a much easier position to defend. Jason cocked his head. Defend against what, sir? he asked. Theo punched a phone number into his cell and hit send. Listen in as I brief Mosley, he instructed. Chapter 2 The small area known as Harbour Town was at the southwesternmost point of Hilton Head. It was a high-end resort area complete with a golf course and private docks, and was the area where the richest of the rich came to play. Nestled comfortably into one of the docks was Theo's personal yacht, a giant vessel that could house a couple dozen people comfortably. Most of the crew had disembarked when they arrived, but Theo knew that his enemies could use it as a striking point, so he kept minimal staff aboard regardless of where they were. Below deck, two of Theo's top men had set up shop. Mosley and Charlie sat in the lounge area, monitoring the exterior of the ship with cameras. Man, this is such a shit detail, Charlie muttered, just sitting on our asses staring at screens. Mosley scoffed. Boy. You better thank your lucky stars we got this detail, he drawled. Would you rather be back at base doing maintenance on trucks and lifting heavy shit? Well, Charlie trailed off. Not really. Then shut your cake hole and keep those feet propped up, Mosley snapped. Enjoy this while you can. Charlie shrugged and muttered to himself, turning back to staring at the monitors several of which were aimed at the grounds and docks, and even with the night vision it was still difficult to see. However, he did spot a blur of something dart across the corner of one of the screens. Got something, he said. Mosley rolled his eyes and got up from the couch, sauntering over to check. Unless I'm blind, I'm not seeing anything, he drawled. You sure you know what you're doing? I swear, something ran across the screen. Charlie insisted, pointing to the corner where he'd seen the blur. Mosley shrugged. Probably just a deer or something, he said. A deer on an island? Charlie asked, raising an eyebrow. At the beach? Mosley paused. His subordinate was right, of course, but he wasn't exactly thrilled by his tone. Before he could snap at him, a banging noise echoed from upstairs. What the hell is that? Charlie asked. Probably the captain, Mosley replied with a sigh. He's been sick the last few days and whining like a little bitch about it. Should we go check it out? Charlie asked, pushing back from the desk a bit. Mosley shook his head. Nah, let one of his underlings take care of it, he ordered. You just keep an eye on those screens. The banging upstairs intensified as Mosley turned to walk back to his seat. Footsteps echoed in the hallway, getting louder, and more banging echoed around. Charlie looked back towards the screen, spotting several figures running around. I got movement, he said quickly. Mosley rushed back up over to the screens this time, and leaned over to watch what was going on. A middle-aged man ran across the grass, 
a few other figures hot on his heels. Looks like someone's about to get their ass kicked, Mosley said, unable to keep the glee from his voice. The two pursuers caught up to the man, tackling him to the ground. But instead of the beating they expected, the man thrashed about as his attackers ripped into his flesh with their teeth. Charlie and Mosley recoiled from the monitor in horror. What the hell is going on? Mosley breathed, swallowing bile at the grisly scene. Before they could say any more, a scream echoed from upstairs, followed by a series of smashes and thumps. The mercenary shared a quick glance and then wordlessly grabbed their assault rifles and rushed towards the door. Mosley peeked out into the hallway, gun at the ready. One of the crewmen poked his head out of his bunk room down the hall, facing the stairs. Captain, everything okay up there? he called. A loud moan echoed down the stairs, followed by hurried footsteps, and a moment later the captain appeared, covered in blood all over his shirt running down from his mouth. Captain? the crewman stammered, shaking his head as he stepped out into the hallway. Are you— Before he could finish, the captain dove through the air, smacking into him, face first. The crewman screamed, but the sound quickly turned to gurgles as his throat was torn apart by his superior's teeth. Mosley shut the door as quietly as he could. Captain's gone nuts, so, he said softly. Gonna have to put him down. Be ready, because this is gonna be loud. Charlie nodded and raised his weapon. Mosley readied his own and cracked open the door. The hinges squeaked, drawing the attention of the feasting captain, whose head snapped up immediately. He let out an inhuman groan, and then hopped to his feet and tore down the hallway towards them. Mosley threw open the door and took aim, sending several rounds towards the center mass, ripping through the captain's chest. This did nothing to slow him down, and he continued to run despite the bullets now tearing him apart. Mosley's eyes widened, blinking in shock at the person, no, the creature that came at him, what the fuck? he cried, and took a step back, running into Charlie. Back up! he barked. His subordinate complied and leapt out of the way, so that Mosley could duck into the door. As the captain reached the threshold, Mosley stuck his leg out and tripped the groaning creature, so that it went face first into the floor. As soon as it landed, Charlie peppered it with rounds in the back, which, once again, did nothing. The monster that was once the captain got to its feet, and Mosley drew his handgun, putting a single round into the back of its head. Finally the body dropped to the floor, unmoving, and both men stared at it in shock. What was that? Charlie finally blurted, shaking his head back and forth rapidly. Pumped that thing full of lead, and it didn't slow it down. Mosley swallowed hard. Looks like headshots are the way to go, he grunted. As they stood there, staring at the dead body, there was a shuffling behind them, and Mosley whipped around. Another crewman from upstairs staggered down towards them, covered in bite marks and gaping wounds, oozing blood all over his body. This time the mercenary took careful aim with his handgun, waiting for the crewman to get within striking distance, before pulling the trigger and planting a bullet deep into its brain. The body slid to a crumpled stop just short of the doorway. Mosley stepped over the corpse to the man the captain had killed, keeping his gun aimed. When he reached the body, he planted his foot over the back of its neck and aimed at the back of its head. Charlie, check them monitors, he called as he stared at the dead man beneath his foot. His phone rang and he didn't take his eyes off of his charge nor falter his aim as he grabbed the cell out of his pocket and answered it. What? he asked. We have a situation, Theo said. No fucking shit, sir, Mosley drawled. I'm well aware we have ourselves a grade-A shit show of a situation. Locals turning rabid? his leader asked. Mosley grimaced. That's an understatement, sir, he replied. Jason and I are in need of pickup, Theo said. His subordinate shook his head sharply. That's a no-go, sir, he said. Captain's dead. Turned into one of those... whatever the hell they are. Don't worry, 
Theo replied. The other two crewmen can pilot the ship. Mosley sighed. One's already dead, he began, and then the body beneath his foot began to move. Hold on a second. He held the receiver of his phone to muffle the sound, and then fired around into the back of the reanimated corpse's head. And now they're both gone, he said, returning the phone to his ear. What happened? Theo asked. Mosley headed back into the monitoring room, closing the door tightly behind him. Best I can tell is that the captain got hungry and started having himself a crewman buffet, he drawled. A few minutes later, they got the munchies themselves. So they were bitten? Theo asked. Mosley grunted. Yeah, he said. Now you mind telling me what in the holy hell is going on? Got a call from Jim, his superior said. Mosley's blood ran cold. Shit, he muttered, shaking his head. A middle-of-the-night call from Jim was never a good thing. Long story short is that anybody with A-type blood is going to drop dead within the next day or so, and become one of those things, Theo explained. And it would appear anybody who gets bitten is going to do the same. Mosley sighed. So much for a cushy detail, he muttered. So, what are we doing about it? We're going to take the island but we need to do some things first, Theo replied. For starters, I'm going to need you and Charlie to secure Harbor Town. Mosley threw up a hand. With all due respect, sir, this place is big as hell. There's only two of us, he protested. Don't worry about the entire community. Just take over the main building and do what you can to clear it out, Theo instructed. If you come across survivors, persuade them to join the fight. Mosley raised an eyebrow. How strongly can I persuade them? he asked. Theo paused for a moment. Nothing is off the table, he finally said. A sick smile slowly grew over Mosley's features. Understood, he said, his mind rolling a mile a minute at what a global event such as this could mean for their freedom to do as they wished. Jason and I will be heading out shortly to come your way. Theo continued. I expect to have a safe spot to take shelter when I arrive. Mosley nodded. Yes, sir, he said. We'll be ready. Oh, and sir, he asked. Yes, Theo replied. Make sure you aim for the head, Mosley said, motioning with a finger gun. Seems to be the only thing that'll bring one of these bastards down. Understood, Theo replied, and then ended the call. Mosley shoved his cell back into his pocket and walked back over to Charlie, who stared at the monitors. It looked like the noise of their gunshots had attracted half a dozen monsters, most of whom were covered in blood and bite marks. How are we looking? Charlie asked. Mosley leaned over his shoulder. Crew's dead, and we have a blank check to do whatever is necessary to clear this place out. He studied the monitors. Looks like we drew quite the crowd. He smacked Charlie's shoulder. Come on, let's get geared up. Got a lot of work ahead of us, boy. Chapter 3 No Name and Kemp sat in beach chairs set up at the front of a large hangar on the military base. It was a huge place, nearly a mile from one side to the other, and buzzed with activity. Men loaded up trucks in preparation to leave the base, others being led away, looking downtrodden. Some visibly seemed displeased about it, with some minor protesting. Commander, it's been a few years since I was in the military, Kemp drawled, curling his bulky arms behind his head. But I'm struggling to recall a time when there was this much activity at this late an hour. I know the top brass likes to rally the troops early and all, but this is something else. No Name nodded thoughtfully, tilting his bald head back and forth. Something is definitely amiss here, he agreed. As they continued to watch the action, another mercenary walked up towards them carrying a phone. His brow was furrowed in confusion, and he looked back and forth between the two seated men. Um, excuse me, he said. Is one of you two... No Name? Kemp grinned and pointed to his bald superior. You found him, he said. The mercenary held out the phone. You, um, he stammered. 
You have a call, sir. As he passed it off, he shook his head. Sir, if you don't mind me asking, what kind of name is No Name? You have people you care about? The bold mercenary asked as he took the phone. Sir? The mercenary asked, cocking his head. Wife? Kids? Friends? No Name asked. Anybody? The younger man nodded. Oh, yes, sir, he said. Wife and a kid. Would you do anything to protect them? He asked. Absolutely, the mercenary replied immediately, nodding even harder. No Name raised an eyebrow. Even give up your identity when asked to deal with some of the most dangerous people in the world? He asked. The mercenary contemplated that for a moment, and then his eyes widened when he realized what it meant. I understand, sir, he said, and then took a step back, turning and walking away. No Name raised the phone to his ear. This is No Name. We have a situation on our hands, Theo said shortly. The bold mercenary nodded. Starting to get that feeling, sir, he said. What's going on? Theo asked. Base is a hive of activity, and none of the locals have seen fit to keep us in the loop, No Name said dryly. Theo sighed. Probably because they don't even know, he mused. Base commander probably doesn't want to spook anybody. No Name stiffened. Sir, what's going on? he asked. A virus, Theo explained. A nasty one. Kills anyone with A-type blood and brings them back to kill. No Name sat up straight, his brow furrowing, blinking rapidly. I'm sorry, sir, he blurted. I didn't catch that. I didn't stutter, and yes, you did, Theo replied firmly. I don't know if they're zombies or what the deal is. All I know is this virus makes them real sick, and when they get back up, their fast, vicious, and headshots are the only thing that brings them down. And they're going to be everywhere. No Name nodded slowly. Guessing that explains the activity, he murmured. He motioned for Kemp to run over and grab the young mercenary to come back over to them. They're retreating, some to sea and some to Kansas, Theo continued. But that doesn't concern us, because we're staying. No Name nodded. What do you need me to do? he asked. I need two fire teams to the island, because we're taking it, Theo replied. The bold mercenary got to his feet. Understood, he said. Helicopter pad is about three quarters of a mile away. We'll head there now. What about the rest of the men? Have them secure the hangar, and once the military is evacuated, secure the rest of the base, Theo instructed. They're not going to be able to take everything when they go, and Jim gave me permission to do whatever I need with what's left. No Name looked around. What's the timeline? he asked, as Kemp caught up with the mercenary and led him back over. By dawn, this thing is going to go tits up, Theo said. We have to be ready. No Name nodded sharply. Understood, he replied. Where is the landing zone? Harbor Town, his superior said. I'll make sure the parking lot is clear. On the way, No Name said, and ended the call, shoving the phone into his pocket as Kemp returned with the mercenary in tow. This here's Jackie, Kemp said, motioning to his companion. Yes, sir, the mercenary asked. Jackie, I need you to prep two fire teams and have them ready to go in ten, No Name said. I also want this building fortified to withstand an invasion. Jackie furrowed his brow. What? he asked. What's going on, sir? A whole lot of trouble is coming our way, No Name replied firmly. And we have to be ready. Oh, the young mercenary replied and took a deep breath. Oh, okay. Anything else? No Name paused for a moment and then ran his tongue over his teeth. He knew what he had to do, and he knew that it wasn't going to be well received. Anybody with A-type blood needs to be quarantined in a secure room, he finally said. And when I say secure, I mean secure. Jackie eyed him warily, seemingly unsure of the order, but seemed to think better of arguing. Okay, sir, he said. I'll make sure it's done. No name tapped the communicator on his vest. We're on channel 12, he said. Have those fire teams standing by. Jackie nodded and ran off, leaving Kemp standing there with his arms crossed. Commander, you want to fill me in here? he asked, raising an eyebrow. World's about to be overrun by zombies, and we're taking the island for ourselves, No Name replied simply. 
Kemp blinked at him. Um, he blinked again. Can you run that by me again? He asked. On our way to the helicopter pad, his bold superior urged, waving for him to follow. We gotta move. Kemp trotted after him to catch up. But what was that about A-type blood? He asked. The virus causing this targets people with it. No name explained. They get sick, fall over, and then get back up. Kemp shook his head and stopped short. Wait, it makes them sick? He asked. The bold mercenary nodded, slowing down to look at his partner. Apparently so, he huffed. We need to get to the infirmary, Kemp said. No name shook his head. My guess is that's the last place we want to be, he replied. It's also the last place Carl is going to want to be, Kemp said firmly. He broke his ankle a few hours ago and got taken there. The bold mercenary paused and then nodded in agreement. It's a little out of our way, but we'll get him, he said. Come on. They raced out of the hangar, stopping just outside to look around for a vehicle. Kemp shook his head when they found nothing. Patrol came through an hour ago, he said. Took anything that was running. Nothing like a little early morning cardio, no name said dryly, and they jogged towards the infirmary. Their weapons hung over their shoulders, bouncing from side to side as they went. A few hundred yards later they spotted a group of soldiers that had been force-marched past their position earlier. There were a few dozen of them, surrounded by half a dozen heavily armed soldiers. Several of the group were having trouble standing, coughing, and generally looking sick. A few that were in better condition actively yelled at the guards, spitting angrily. "'You motherfucker!' one of them cried pointing at one of the armed guards' noses. I fought beside you for God's sake! Why are you doing this to us? They stood silently, nobody having a good answer. They were just following orders, and No Name wasn't even certain that they knew what those orders were about. Maybe if they did know, they wouldn't be so calm about rounding up all the sick. One of the guards broke away from the group and held his hands up to stop the two mercenaries. I need to know where you two men are going, he said firmly. Both men flashed their QXR credentials. No, you really don't, No Name said. The guard nodded and took a few steps back, lowering his hands immediately. What's going on here? Kemp asked, motioning to the group. The soldier shrugged. Wish I knew what to tell you, sir, he said with a sigh. We had orders to come down a couple hours ago to quarantine everybody with A-type blood. The men filed into the two-story building of moderate size, and one of them turned, throwing up against the brick wall violently. Two others held on to him to keep him on his feet. I know I'm not a Mensa candidate or anything, but even I can see that just about everybody we're rounding up is sick, the soldier continued, shaking his head. Or is that just one hell of a coincidence? You're not wrong, No Name said, lowering his voice. You just make sure they're locked up good and tight. What's going to happen to them? The soldier asked, eyes widening. No name shook his head. Nothing you're going to want to be around for, and waved for Kemp to keep moving. Before they could take a step, gunfire erupted from the building. The mercenaries immediately drew their assault rifles, the soldier following shortly afterward, his face going pale. Yeah, we're fighting back, one of the six soldiers screeched. Let's go! A few of the infected soldiers turned and grappled with the guards. Bullets flew as they tried to fight them off, but they were errant shots. One of the six soldiers turned to the door to open it up, wanting to help the ones inside that were fighting back. He flew back, knocked down by a couple of soldiers running out, bite wounds on their arms, no weapons inside. A split second later, the floodgates opened. Dozens of zombified soldiers ran hard through the pack. Several of them stopped to feast on the infected and guards alike. Screams and the sound of tearing flesh filled the air, panic fire popping off throughout. No Name and Kemp quickly raised their weapons, taking aim. Headshots only, the bold mercenary bellowed. The private let out a cry as he raised his own weapon. No Name led the retreat, searching for somewhere to fortify. They wanted to get to the infirmary but the more pressing matter right now was getting away from this shit show that was going to grow, and grow, and grow. They backpedaled while firing, but the corpses were too fast, and there were too many of them. 
Headshots took them down, but some of the shots went wild, and three against the horde weren't good odds. Not to mention that anyone in their way that they overtook got back up and hit the ground running. No Name lunged to the side, firing point-blank into a ghoul that came at Kemp's side, kicking another in the chest to knock it back. The private screamed as he continued to fire, his eyes wide as he unloaded. Get up on here! No Name barked, spotting a jeep behind him. Kemp scrambled for it as the bold mercenary kept spraying the oncoming ghouls with bullets, and when the soldier and his second were safely up top, they began to cover him while he made for a run for it. Finally, the back of the group emerged from the building, signaling the end of the sick people that had been quarantined. It looked like they'd all turned, and if there were any left inside, they'd likely be dead and getting ready to get back up soon enough. The sea below them as they fired was a mix of soldier uniform and hospital garb. Sick people and their jailers, now all gnashing teeth and roomy eyes and clawed hands. No Name's heart thundered in his ears. He hadn't believed it before, but now, seeing it was a whole other thing. Flesh-eating zombies, turned from a virus and spreading with bites. It was a horror movie come to life, and if this had as large of a reach as Theo had said, then it was an apocalypse movie come to life too. Soon piles of corpses littered the ground, surrounding the jeep and creating a hill for the ghouls behind. Thankfully, the trio had more bullets than there were zombies, and eventually the bodies lay unmoving on the ground. What the fuck? the private stammered, but choked off at the sound of moans and thundering footsteps. No Name's blood ran cold. It seemed that the sick hadn't been as contained as they'd thought. He leapt down to the ground as zombies poured around buildings from every direction. It appeared they'd been drawn to the gunfire. Go! Now! he barked, motioning to the closest building, a one-story office building a few hundred yards away. Kemp and the private leapt down and stayed hot on his heels as the ghouls converged. He fired, but his rifle was too clunky for close range, and he used it as a club instead, smacking back ghouls. Just get to the door, he yelled as he beat the corpses away. They just needed to buy enough time to get inside and regroup and figure out what they were going to do. With the grunting behind him, he assumed that the others were doing the same, and he hoped he was creating enough of a path that they could keep up. When he reached the office building, he grabbed the handle, thanking whatever deity was on their side that the door was unlocked, and threw it open. Part of him knew that they would have to sweep the inside, but at the moment, the dark building was a hell of a lot safer than the zombie buffet outside. As soon as the others were in, he jerked the door shut, a few flailing arms getting caught in the frame. No Name put his foot against the wall and held it shut as hard as he could. Kemp leapt into action, using the butt of his rifle to try to smack the limbs back outside. He grunted when that didn't work, and flipped his rifle around, firing through the gap. Finally the bodies fell limp and he was able to shove them back. No Name finally latched the door a few grotesque clawing fingers coming off in the process and falling to the tiles. Corpses pressed against the glass, slamming into the windows on either side of the door, and the trio backed away from it. What in the hell is going on out here? A colonel barked, coming to the front of the building from the back room, causing the three men to whip around to face the officers. It seemed there was a split of two front and back sections, and apparently the colonel was working late, or early as it was. A skinny young private emerged with him, a half-step behind. Is the back door to this place secure? Kemp asked breathlessly. I didn't ask you, QXR mercs, the colonel snapped, and pointed to the soldier with them. What is going on, Private Hatch? The private opened his mouth, but no name stepped forward with menace in his eyes. Is the back door to this place secure? he demanded. The colonel sneered at him. I don't know who you think you are, but you are not gonna— No name shoved him out of the way and addressed the soldier behind him. Go secure the back door, now, he urged. His tone made the younger man not even question who was giving the order, 
and turned, running immediately to the back. Now wait a goddamn minute! Marks, get your ass back here! the colonel cried, and when the private didn't return, he whirled on no name, rage in his eyes. I know the brass wants you assholes on base, but you have no authority to— No name held a finger up to his mouth, and the colonel stopped talking, his eyes widening at the sound of banging and moaning at the front door. You hear that? the bold mercenary asked. I think they care about your authority as much as I do right now, which is to say none. The colonel's brow furrowed. Who is making that racket? he demanded. Colonel Hopkins. It's the sick people, Hatch stammered shakily, wringing his hands. You know, the ones we were quarantining? Hopkins furrowed his brow. They don't sound very sick, he snapped. That's because they're dead, No Name replied. Well, undead. You mercenary boys getting into some hardcore drugs over there? the colonel demanded. Private Marks came running back into the room. Sir, the back door is secure, he reported, standing at attention. I checked the windows as well and pulled down the shades too. Whoever is out there won't be able to see inside. Good work, No Name replied with a nod. So what now, Commander? Kemp asked, inclining his head towards the front. No Name flicked on his communicator. Jackie, do you copy? he asked. The returning noise was full of gunfire and screams, but he was able to make out a yelled, We got a situation, sir. Are you able to secure the building? No Name asked. Yes, sir, but there's a lot of those things coming our way. Jackie cried. The bold mercenary took a deep breath. Solidify the position. Contact me when secure, he instructed. Yes, sir. Jackie yelled back firmly. Guessing a pickup is out of the question? Kemp drawled. No name cocked his head. Depends, he said, glancing at Hopkins. You got someone that can pick us up? Doubt it, the colonel replied. Anything with four wheels and an engine has been taken off base. Some big troop movement or something. The front door creaked, the wood straining beneath the pressure outside. We need to reinforce that door, No Name said, and Kemp waved Hatch over to help him drag a heavy wooden desk against the creaking wood. Then what, sir? Marx asked, taking a deep breath. No Name crossed his arms and replied, We wait. Chapter 4 Jason stood in the living room of Theo's house, double-checking a stash of weapons. There were two handguns, two assault rifles, four knives, and a boatload of spare ammunition. It had been a while since any of these guns had been fired, and even longer since they'd been fired in live combat, so the last thing they needed was for the guns to crap out on them in the middle of battle. As he checked them, a scream echoed from outside. Jason raced to the window, looking out towards the beach. A woman flailed in the sand, struggling to dislodge an attacker that had bitten into her leg. She kicked and thrashed, and two more creatures darted over, pouncing onto her in an undead dog pile. As her screams turned to gurgles, Jason swallowed hard, shaking his head and saying a silent prayer as he turned back to the weapons. How are we looking? Theo asked as he emerged from the bedroom, securing his belt as he walked. Three hostiles on the beach, Jason replied, jerking a thumb over his shoulder towards the window. About to be four if the intel about bites is correct. Theo nodded. Anything to the front? he asked. Haven't checked in a few minutes, Jason replied. I'll take care of it, Theo said. Just finish up with the weapon check. Jason finished up stashing all the weapons into a canvas bag for divvying up. He headed to the front of the house, sidling up to the window next to his boss, to peer out into the dark. The SUV was parked in the driveway, about fifteen yards from the front door. The moonlight wasn't all that bright, but he could see a few houses across the street with things moving in the shadows. Theo pulled away from the window, turning to him, and Jason handed over a handgun, knife, and an assault rifle. He geared himself up, and they shoved three extra magazines into their pockets. Can we get to the vehicle? Jason asked. Theo nodded. There's some movement across the way, but I think we'll be okay, he said. 
You driving or me? Jason asked. Theo rolled his eyes. I didn't spend all that money on combat driving courses for you guys to get behind the wheel myself, he retorted. His subordinate smirked. Fair enough, sir, he drawled. Keys? Theo asked. Jason held them up, jingling them in his free hand. His boss nodded. We have to move quick, he instructed. Get out of the neighborhood and head towards the highway. If we can make it there, we should be good. On your mark, sir, Jason said with a nod, tightening his grip as he curled his hand around the doorknob. Theo nodded and raised his handgun, and then gave a soft, Go! and the door flew open. The duo bolted outside, staying as quiet as they could. Despite years of training and moving immediately to the grass, the mere noise of their footfalls on the front walkway attracted attention. Four zombies burst out of the darkness across the street and raced towards them. Jason's heart thundered in his ears, but he kept his eye on the prize, tearing for the driver's side door and diving inside, slamming the door shut just as the ghoul slammed into the side of the vehicle. Theo tore around the side, firing into a zombie's forehead that waited for him there. The noise only attracted more attention, and he opened the passenger door just as two more corpses bolted from beside his house. Jason fired through the windshield, hitting the lead creature in the chest. It stumbled back into its friends and both fell to the ground, giving Theo just enough time to leap into the passenger seat and slam the door behind him. Go! he barked. Jason started up the vehicle and threw it in reverse dragging some zombies along with him for a moment before they dropped off. He put it into drive and they sped off down the darkened neighborhood road. Are you okay, sir? Jason asked once they were relatively safe and moving. Theo nodded. Yeah, nice shooting, he replied. Sorry about the windshield, his subordinate said dryly. Theo chuckled. If that's the worst thing that happens to us today, he trailed off, shaking his head. The SUV sped down the road, and they eventually reached the highway. They made the turn to the south towards Harbour Town and floored it. They didn't make it more than a quarter mile before a speeding car came out from a side street, blindsiding them and smashing into the rear axle. The crash was so violent that their vehicle spun 180 degrees, dislodging the axle completely from the body of the car. The driver's side window shattered, and Jason cringed, peeling his eyes open once the vehicle came to a stop. Both men breathed heavily for a moment, regaining their composure. Sir, are you okay? Jason asked, reaching over to shake his boss's shoulder. Theo blinked groggily, looking around with glazed-over eyes. Huh? Yeah, he drawled. Yeah, I'm good. You? We gotta move, sir, Jason said firmly. He pushed open his door drawing his handgun and keeping his head on a swivel. He moved towards the other vehicle, spotting a female zombie lodged in the windshield, having flown out from the inside. The driver was still buckled into the seat, bleeding from the throat. Their eyes met for a moment, the man's eyes pleading despite his mouth not moving, but Jason knew he couldn't do anything. He rushed back to the SUV, slinging his assault rifle back over his shoulder, and rushing to the passenger's side to help Theo get out. I got you, sir. I got you, he said. Theo groaned as he stepped down onto the road. Other driver? he asked. Too dead, Jason replied. They looked around for a moment, and he spotted a row of houses just off of the highway, about a hundred yards away. He chewed his bottom lip for a moment, glancing to the houses and then back at his boss, who still had that glazed, woozy look about him. Come on, sir, we need to get to some shelter, he urged, making the snap decision to hole up in a house until Theo was feeling better. If he wanted to get his boss out of this alive, he needed him to be functional. He pulled Theo along, the latter finally regaining some of his legs. They were about halfway to the row of houses when the echo of rapidly approaching footsteps cut through the air. Jason turned just in time, letting go of Theo and stepping in front of him to aim his handgun. He fired, missing the first one by hitting it in the jaw instead of the brain, firing again quickly and catching the nose this time. This extra shot, however, cost him the second kill, and another zombie reached him, latching onto his forearm. Jason howled, 
white-hot fire exploding up his arm. It didn't feel like a normal bite. The zombie's jaw was like a vice, and its teeth nearly crunched his bone beneath. It was almost as if he could feel the infection now coursing through his veins, and his heart rate tripled with fear. He struggled with the beast for a moment before managing to raise his gun and fire into its temple, splattering its brain all over the road. He kicked it away, panting, and stared dumbfounded at his arm for a half-second, before stealing his resolve. The bite was a death sentence, but he was still alive, and as long as he drew breath, he had a job to do. Protect Theo. Are you okay? his boss asked. Jason nodded as he pulled him to his feet. I'll be okay, sir. Let's keep moving, he declared. They hobbled through the neighborhood, looking for a place to take shelter. Jason scanned the area quickly, finally spotting a house a few doors down that didn't have a vehicle in front of it. They had enough issues without having to fight off a homeowner. Come on, sir, we're almost there, he urged, and pulled his boss along. A few yards from the house, however, half a dozen zombies emerged from the darkness, illuminated by a streetlight. Jason tensed up as they screamed and tore towards the duo. Sir, I need you to get into the house, Jason said firmly, writing Theo's stance. His boss struggled a little, but managed to get his footing on his own. As soon as he was steady, Jason grabbed his assault rifle and took aim, sending a torrent of bullets downrange. They struck the targets, some in the head and some in the chest. Two dropped for good, but the others merely stumbled. He waited until they were a little closer before firing again, struggling to aim in the dark. But there was enough light for him to find the target. Finally, after what felt like far too many three-round bursts, he managed to put them all down. When the coast was clear, he ran over to the house, where Theo was still out front, trying to get inside. When he heard the footsteps, he moved out of the way, leaning on the wall and still looking dazed. When Jason reached the door, he kicked it several times, finally breaking the frame clean off. Before he could get it fully open, however, the neighbor's outdoor light flicked on, and a rotund, bold man emerged from the front door. "'I will shoot you myself, and then call the cops,' he bellowed, pointing a shotgun at the duo. "'So you'd better just walk away from Bill's house.' "'Sir, get back inside and barricade the door,' Jason yelled, placing himself in front of Theo. The neighbor snared. "'Counteroffer!' he called back. "'You do what I tell you, and I don't put you in the ground!' "'Get back in the house now!' Jason cried. "'It's not safe out here!' The bold man pumped the shotgun, chambering around. "'Oh, you right about that!' he barked. Jason reached for his handgun, but a zombie beat him to the punch, tearing out of the darkness towards the shotgun-wielding man. The man's eyes went wide, but he didn't have time to react before the creature was on him. He fired the shotgun, hitting the ground as the ghoul latched onto him. Two more followed from the road, reaching the house and the now screaming meal. A female scream came from inside the house, drawing two more of the monsters inside. All Jason could do was give the door one more kick now that he was unencumbered by having a shotgun pointed at his head. With a crack, it finally gave way, allowing them entry. When they reached the living room, he shut the door as far as it would go with the broken frame, before grabbing the couch and sliding it over. Theo regained enough composure to stand guard in case they weren't alone in the house. Not going to hold much, but this isn't a long-term destination, Jason grunted. Theo took a deep breath. I'll sweep the house, he said, his voice finally sounding more steady. You deal with that arm. Jason clenched his jaw, straightening to face his boss, but Theo held up a hand. That's an order, he said firmly. He raised his gun, and though he was still a little wobbly, he was a lot more lucid than he had been. Jason took a deep breath and nodded, rushing off to the kitchen to follow his order as quickly as possible so he could get back to work. He turned on the oven light so he could see, but not draw too much attention to them, grabbing a dish towel and wiping at his arm. He hissed at the sight of the bite in his skin. It was disgusting, and mostly coagulated already, 
shiny and oozy, with the surrounding skin rapidly turning reddish-purple. He shook his head with a scoff. At least I lasted a full hour into the zombie apocalypse, he thought bitterly, and then chuckled at himself. He had a lot to do before he could call it quits, and he didn't want to spend the rest of his short life on this earth in bad spirits. Chapter 5 Mosley and Charlie made their way to the top of the boat, loaded down with ammunition to go along with their assault rifle and handgun. As they made it to the top door, Mosley took the lead and peeked outside. A ramp led down from the dock to the deck, and about eight zombies lingered within fifteen yards of the bottom. There was only one ghoul on the deck, a few yards away from the door. Mosley looked past it to the buildings. Their target, the community center, was a couple hundred yards away. There wasn't much light, so he couldn't see if there were any more zombies standing in their way. He gently closed the door and turned to Charlie, keeping his voice at a whisper. One on the deck, a whole mess of them by the ramp, he said softly. You lead the way out and handle the close one. I'll take the ramp. Charlie nodded, but swallowed hard. And then what? he asked. We haul ass to the community center, Mosley replied. We gotta assume the ruckus we're about to cause is going to make us real popular, so we're going to have to move. His partner nodded again. The longer we wait, the more of those things that will be popping up, he replied, raising his gun. So let's get to it. Mosley nodded, appreciating the young man's eagerness to get into the fight. They swapped positions so that Charlie was in the lead, hand around the doorknob. He threw open the door and fired immediately, taking out the ghoul on the deck. Mosley swept past him, laying waste to the ones coming up the ramp. The noise seemed to draw the attention of zombies everywhere as they began to pour out from the darkness. The mercenaries reacted accordingly, falling into instinct and training. Bullets flew, gunshots fired, Knives flashed, and they battled their way to the street. Keep moving, Mosley grunted, as he kicked a zombie into its friend, sending it hurtling backwards and knocking over a few more corpses. He fired twice to put them both down, but more just hurtled forward to replace them. If they were going to get to the community center, they were going to have to stop fighting and start deflecting. Charlie stabbed a ghoul in the eye socket and then twisted away from it avoiding an outstretched arm. Mosley ducked behind a car, tearing around it and diving over the trunk to slip past a trio of ghouls on the far side. They turned and attempted to reach him over the car instead of going around it, which he noted that they weren't very smart. Charlie yelled something, and Mosley whipped around as footsteps pounded pavement behind them. He took off running, the two mercenaries pumping their legs hard, but soon enough, Another group appeared beneath a streetlight ahead. Fuck! Mosley barked, and raised his gun as they continued to sprint. He fired as accurately as he could, taking out ones in the middle so they could just punch through the group to the other side. Charlie did the same, shooting just to the left of him, and thankfully that helped the gap stay a little wide, instead of the zombies closing it right away. When they got close, Mosley turned his rifle sideways, using it as a battering ram, and gave a great shove to the side as he pushed through the group, barely avoiding a set of gnashing teeth as they blew past. The noise of Charlie huffing just behind him told him his companion had made it too, and they continued on. The ghouls quickly recovered and whirled around, joined by the ones who'd been in pursuit, and then the community center came into view. More zombies came out of the darkness from the sides, and Mosley did some quick math in his head. Just go, he bellowed. There was no way they'd make it if they stopped for even a second. They had to make it to the door, and hope to hell that it was unlocked. As if in answer to his prayer, the door opened, and a head popped out, somebody waving frantically at them and yelling, Come on, come on, the man cried and this managed to spur the mercenaries on even more. Mosley pumped his legs as hard as they would go, his thighs burning, trying to keep tunnel vision and not look at the clusters of flesh-eating monsters coming from all sides. 
He flew through the door with Charlie hot on his heels, and the man who'd been holding it slammed it just in time, the telltale thumps of bodies smashing into it from the other side muffled. Holy hell! Are you boys okay? The owner of the yelling voice asked, stepping towards them. It was a civilian, a man easily in his early fifties. He wasn't overweight, per se, but he wasn't fit either. Yeah, we're good, Charlie huffed. You have any idea what's going on out there? The man asked, waving a vague hand at the front doors. Mosley growled as he caught his breath. Yeah, we're at the front edge of a Category 5 shit hurricane, he said gruffly. I heard the gunfire and came out from the back room, the man explained, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. We're trying to stay out of sight so those things don't get agitated. Charlie raised an eyebrow. We? he asked. Come on, the man said, waving for them to follow. I'll introduce you. He led them to the back room, and the mercenaries looked around at the other civilians. They didn't look like much. A blonde woman and man in their mid-forties, and two in their mid-thirties, maybe. A muscular man and a mild-mannered-looking woman. That's Jane, their guide said, motioning to the first woman and pointing down the line. Desmond, Danny, and Nancy. I'm Ed, he turned back to the mercenaries. And you boys are? Mosley clucked his tongue. Not interested in making acquaintances, he said flatly. Then what do we call you? Danny snapped. Sir, Mosley shot back. Now, what's the situation here? Danny threw up his hands. You tell us, he demanded. You probably know more than we do. I don't give a shit about the why. I care about the what and where, Mosley snarled. Those things outside want to kill us, and that's all you need to know. What I need to know is where they're at and how many of them we have to clear out. Jane motioned vaguely behind her. There are some villas down by the water, she said shakily. A few hundred yards from here. We all came from there. And? Mosley urged, rolling his hand in the air to prompt her to keep going. She pursed her lips and pointed to the bite on her arm. And I'm in no hurry to go back, she said dryly. Charlie started to raise his weapon, but Mosley discreetly pushed it back down before anyone else could see. Anybody else hurt? he asked. Desmond pulled up one of his pant legs to show a nasty bite on his calf. One of those things grabbed me as I was running out the door, he explained. Latched onto me like a junkyard dog. How many of those things are we talking about down there? Charlie asked, inclining his head. I don't know, Ed replied, scratching his chin. Thirty? Maybe forty? Charlie pursed his lips. We got the ammo, but that's a hell of a run for just the two of us, he said. Mosley took a deep breath and faced the group. If we start raising some hell, do we have to worry about anybody else coming to join the party? he asked. I don't understand, Ed said slowly, shaking his head. Are there any other houses nearby? Mosley asked, throwing up his hands with a scoff. Jesus, this ain't that difficult. Oh, Ed replied, his face reddening with embarrassment. No, closest community is about half a mile up. Danny sniffled. And if it's anything like it was here, they're going to have plenty of things to focus on where they are, he added. The mercenaries nodded, backing up a bit and leaning together to confer in low voices. What do you think? Charlie asked quietly. Mosley clucked his tongue. I think two of them are already goners, and frankly I don't give a shit about the rest, he replied. We need to secure this area, that's our only concern. Agreed, his subordinate said slowly. But what about the bites? We saw what they did to the crew. Mosley shrugged. They were dead, though, he said. Maybe it doesn't kick in until then. Still, Charlie dragged out the word. Any objection to me keeping a close eye on them? He asked. Mosley nodded. I'd prefer it if you did, he admitted. So, what's the plan? Danny called from the group, causing them both to turn. How are we getting out of here? Mosley smirked, cocking his head. Well, looking at the little eager beaver over there, he drawled. Glad to see you have a bit of gumption in you, boy, because you're going to need it. We ain't going anywhere because we're clearing this place out. 
Protests and hisses rose in the group, Ed included. "'Are you shitting me?' Danny exclaimed over the rest, throwing up his hands. "'You want us to fight those things? No way in hell!' Mosley walked straight over to him, drawing his handgun and poising it directly against Danny's forehead. The woman screamed, and the energy in the room shifted quickly from worried to terrified. This was good. Fear was easy to use to their advantage. Now, you listen to me, shitbag, Mosley growled. We have a mission to accomplish, and you're going to help us. Danny swallowed hard, but jutted out his chin. Or what, you'll kill us? he asked, voice quivering. Oh yeah, I'll kill you, Mosley said, maniacal glee lighting up his eyes. He lowered the gun until the barrel rested against the man's crotch. In the most painful and humiliating way imaginable. Danny gulped, shaking his head. Nothing but a low squeak coming out of his mouth. That's what I thought, Mosley said his voice menacing, and then straightened, facing the group. Okay, listen up. You got ten minutes to get ready. Find a weapon, make peace with whatever fairy godmother in the sky you bow down to. I don't really give a shit, but when ten minutes is up, you'd better be ready to roll out. Chapter 6 the mercenaries were holed up in an office building along with the two privates and Colonel Hopkins. A couple dozen zombies smacked against the front trying to get inside, and a few more banged their way around to the back. Despite their best efforts to keep a low profile, they had still attracted attention. I don't think they're going away, Commander, Kemp murmured, shaking his head. No Name took a deep breath and nodded. The longer we wait... The worse it's going to get, he agreed. We have to get moving. Where in the hell do you boys think you're going? Hopkins snapped. Infirmary, No Name replied. Then to the helicopter pads. The colonel growled. You're insane if you think I'm going to let you get to the infirmary, he said. Kemp raised an eyebrow. You might be a little off your rocker yourself if you think you can stop us, he drawled. Hopkins got to his feet, fists clenched, but No Name held up his hand. If we don't move from this position, we run the risk of getting trapped, he said calmly, but leaving no room for argument. What about your men? Marx piped up. Can't they come save us eventually? Kemp sighed. Assuming they survive, kid, he said, shaking his head. With a base this size, there's going to be hundreds, maybe even into the low thousands of those things out there. Our men are good, but there's a limit to everything. He's right, No Name agreed. We have to assume that nobody is coming to save us. Plus, we're on a timeline. Hopkins narrowed his eyes. What are you boys planning? he asked. Us? Kemp blinked at him. We're not planning anything. We're just like you, following orders. The colonel wrinkled his nose, clearly not liking the answer, but eventually nodded. Fair enough he said gruffly. Still, the infirmary is a quarter mile away, on the other side of a few rows of buildings. How are you planning on getting there? Same way we got here, No Name said. Hoofing it. The banging on the front of the building continued to grow, and a crack started up from the windows, spider webbing across the glass. The five men began to back away from the front of the building, tension rising in the air. Marks, Hatch, the bold mercenary instructed. Make sure they're not doing the same thing in the back. The colonel didn't object, whether from being too afraid or just giving in to the situation, letting his men run off at no name's behest. Both mercenaries raised their assault rifles, training them on the front windows. You got a weapon? No name asked, inclining his head to the colonel. Just a sidearm, Hopkins replied. The bold mercenary resisted the urge to roll his eyes. Pretty sure that qualifies as a weapon, he snapped. This might be a good time to draw it. The colonel clenched his jaw and pulled out his handgun, readying it. Nobody shoots until I do, No Name said firmly, and continued to backpedal towards the rear of the building. Boys, how are we looking back there? he called. Count about eight of them by the door and windows, but everything is holding so far, Hatch called back. 
Get through the door, No Name instructed. Hopkins and Kemp darted over to the main door leading to the other portion of the building. No Name stood where he was, readying his weapon, and when he was in position, he opened fire to shoot out the glass at the front of the building. Within seconds, zombies flooded inside, scrambling over each other to get in at the fresh meal. No Name ducked inside and secured the door. What in the hell did you do that for? Hopkins cried. If they're inside, then it makes it difficult for them to pursue us when we get outside, the bold mercenary replied simply. He moved over to a nearby desk, motioning to Hatch and Marks to help him. The trio managed to move the heavy metal and wood desk in front of the exterior door, leaving a five-foot gap. No name pointed to another nearby desk, and they dragged that one against the first, creating a barricade. Meanwhile, the moans from the other side of the interior door rose in volume, the footsteps thundering ever closer. Kemp and I are going out the back and heading to the infirmary, No Name said. If I were you boys, I'd haul ass over to the helicopter landing pad, assuming it's still there, of course. Mark swallowed hard. And if it's not? he asked. Find a quiet spot to hide, and hope to God our men can secure the place, the bold mercenary said gravely. Hopkins raised his chin. And if they can't, he demanded, then we'll see you on the other side, because none of us will be lasting long, No Name replied, voice cold. Great motivational speech there, Commander, Kemp deadpanned. The bold mercenary shrugged. They don't pay me to be a motivator, he said. I can see that, Kemp quipped. The two mercenaries set up behind the desks, ready to throw down. Private Marks reached for the doorknob, readying himself to open it. Gentlemen, good luck to you all, No Name said firmly, and then nodded to the private. As soon as he turned the knob, the door burst inwards, smacking him in the face as two zombies burst inside. No Name and Kemp opened fire, shredding the beasts before they could do any damage. They waited a beat, just in case more ghouls came in to press against their makeshift barricade but it seemed the coast was clear. Everybody move, No Name instructed. Marx wrinkled his now bleeding nose, getting up from the floor and shaking his head to join the colonel. As they darted outside, Hopkins and No Name shared a nod, and then the trio of soldiers took off into the darkness in the opposite direction of the infirmary. The bold mercenary didn't spare them a thought, focusing on the task at hand, which was finding Carl, hopefully alive. They crept along the wall, but they weren't alone for long. No Name hadn't held any illusions of making the quarter mile to the infirmary without meeting any ghouls, but he'd hoped they could stealth around a little bit at least. It wasn't to be, however, as a pack of six zombies tore around the corner, catching sight of them. No Name and Kemp raised their guns, each taking a trio on each side, working in unison as they always had. In the heat of battle, Training kicked in, and the threat of getting bitten by a flesh-eating monster made it even easier to fall into tactical mode. There was no hesitating, no thought of right and wrong, only survival. The mercenaries took care of the half-dozen ghouls and tore past the fallen corpses behind the next building over. Footsteps and moans echoed behind them, but No Name kept his eyes strained forward, just waiting for ghouls to come out of the darkness. Ideally, they would have stealthed this, but the zombies moved so quickly that getting the drop on more than one or two with hand-to-hand -hand combat was too dangerous. They needed to get through the base fast and live through it. A pack of ghouls came into the light up ahead, and this group was a lot larger than a half-dozen. No name skidded to a stop, Kemp doing the same, and glanced behind him. Enough ghouls were behind them and gaining that they couldn't backtrack and he looked around frantically for another option. There, Kemp hissed, pointing to a door across the road. The building looked like some kind of warehouse, and was hopefully deserted, considering that it was so early in the morning that the workers wouldn't be around. In this moment, however, it would have to do. The mercenaries took off like a shot, running for the door, and when Kemp turned the knob, it didn't budge. He grunted and backed up, raising his leg to kick it, but No Name batted him away and fired into the lock. 
The door swung open as the deadbolt obliterated from the wood, and they scrambled inside, pushing back against the door as soon as they did so. Find something, No Name barked as he pressed his considerable frame against the door, and Kemp swept the immediate area quickly, finding an office off to the side with a large thick shelf along one wall. He got behind it and heaved, shoving it with all of his might, and once he got it past the seam in the door, it moved a lot easier along the buffed concrete of the warehouse. No name strained, pressing against the frantic bodies throwing themselves against the other side, waiting until the shelf was almost on top of him before moving. It didn't look like it would hold very long, already starting to move a bit as fingers managed to snake through the sliver in the doorway, but it would have to do for now. Let's go, he said quietly, in case they weren't alone and the two men took off across the warehouse floor. About halfway through, there was a crash as the shelf fell, spurring them along. Kemp let out a surprised cry as a zombie staggered around a stack of crates into his field of vision and fired point-blank into its forehead. No Name moved forward a little slower, realizing that a whole wall of bay doors stood open at the far end. Of course they did. The military had loaded up as much as they could before they were supposed to be taking off. Zombies milled about outside, tearing around. Screams echoed, turning to gurgles as soldiers were overtaken by the monsters. The base quickly swarmed with these things that were going to be the death of humanity. No name couldn't help but feel that it was too late for Carl. But they couldn't just leave without checking. The mercenary was a beastly tough man. If anyone could make it through something like this with a broken ankle, it would be him. Commander! Kemp hissed, motioning to the right. There was a smaller door surrounded by a wall of glass windows, away from the bay doors and with no shadows running around outside of it. Definitely a better option than heading out front into the chaos. They ran that way, and he stopped by a toolbox and grabbed a crowbar from on top of it whipping it as hard as he could towards the bay doors. The loud clank of metal on concrete echoed, hopefully attracting the zombies' attention to over there instead of their little side exit. Kemp went out first, and the duo closed the door quietly behind them, creeping through the darkness across a patch of grass, a little closer to their destination. As No Name peered around a corner, he realized they'd made a grave mistake coming this way. The wall they were hugging belonged to the barracks, where the majority of the base would have been sleeping. What are the chances they managed to get every single sick person out of here? He wondered idly, imagining any number of sick soldiers turning into flesh-eating monsters in their beds and having a midnight snack along the bunks. The front doors of the barracks hung open, and there were a few ghouls running around out front, the infirmary on the far side. They could, in theory, backtrack past the warehouse and go around the back of the barracks and flank the infirmary, but they were short on time. If they were going to get Carl out and get themselves out, then they had to go now. The infirmary itself was in shambles. The front door busted with a fire going nearby. There were bodies on the ground, unmoving, thankfully. No name came back behind the corner, leaning in to Kemp. Five zombies between us and the infirmary. Barracks are open in the front, he murmured softly. His companion sighed quietly. Spread out, he whispered. No name nodded. Enough to go stealth, he said. Kemp took a deep breath. Should we close the barracks? he asked quietly. No name nodded. I'm thinking so, he whispered back. They slung their rifles over their backs and drew their knives. No Name unclipped the holster for his sidearm, making sure it was easily accessible, just in case of an emergency. He peeked back out front, looking back towards the warehouse. It looked like the mobs over there had taken the bait from the crowbar and were disappearing into the bay doors. Hopefully that would keep them busy long enough to get Carl and make it to the helipads. No Name crept along the front of the barracks, stopping just short of the front doors to inspect them, and make sure they'd even latch. It didn't look like there'd been any damage, thankfully. They'd just been left to swing open, so they should hold for at least long enough for them to escape. 
He waved Kemp up and prepared to dart over to the other side, but a moan stopped him dead as a zombie came barreling out through the doors. He stabbed it in the forehead on instinct, heart pounding, and instead of inspecting the darkness of the barracks, he dove over the corpse with his knife still embedded in it and grabbed the far door. Kemp sensed this urgency and closed his side as well, and just as they latched it shut, there were thuds into the other side. No Name whipped around at the sound of footsteps and ducked, throwing his arm out to trip the zombie hurtling towards him. As it fell face first into the ground, Kemp stabbed it in the back of the skull. No Name didn't even have the time to give him a nod of thanks as two more ghouls were almost on them, and he snatched his knife from the zombie he'd killed, not yet ready to concede making noise. He kicked his ghoul in the chest, knocking it back, and it stumbled over a body on the asphalt and fell flat on its ass. No Name didn't give it time to get back up, leaping down onto it and planting his knees into its chest, before driving his blade into its eye socket. The three left behind them and the infirmary weren't close enough to have heard anything, and both men got to their feet, chests heaving. No Name's heart raced, and he fought to steady his breathing. Carl had better be alive, he thought, as they moved as soundlessly as they could to the other side, staying in the shadows as they approached the infirmary. The closest two were about five yards apart, both staggering around in slow circles, aimless and deceptively slow-looking. No name motioned with his fingers for Kemp to take the right, and then counted down from three. At one, he pointed, and the two darted from cover. Kemp seemed to catch his zombie unaware, stabbing it and catching the body before it hit the ground. But No Names caught sight of him and moaned, lunging for him, teeth first. Out of instinct, the bold mercenary punched it in the face, catching it in the cheek with a sickening crunch and whipping its head to the side. He didn't wait, slamming his knife into its temple, and its body crumpled just in time to reveal the final ghoul tearing towards him. In a blur of black, Kemp flew through the air into the zombie, knocking it to the ground. No Name lunged forward to cover him, making sure that the ghoul didn't get the upper hand on the ground. Kemp pressed his hands into its chest, keeping its gnashing teeth away from him, and No Name stabbed it in the face. Fuck, these things are strong, Kemp huffed, as No Name helped him back up to his feet. Come on, we need to get to Coral. No Name urged quietly raising his blade and moving quickly, but soundlessly, to the front door. They moved quietly inside, and the bold mercenary winced at each crunch of glass beneath his boots from the shattered front doors. Behind the front desk, there was a wall of surveillance monitors, and he leaned over to inspect them. He pointed to one of the treatment rooms, the glass doors and windows on one side completely obstructed by zombies clustered around it. There must be survivors in there, he murmured scanning the rest of the monitors and finding nothing. If every zombie in the building was clustered around that one room, that gave him hope. They moved silently through the building, following the simple floor plan to flank the rows of treatment rooms. They passed the back windows of a few empty ones, and then found the one they were looking for. Carl stood inside, his back to them, his beastly frame pressed up against the large double doors. They bowed a bit from the weight pressing on the other side, and he cried out as he pushed back. No Name's gut dropped to the floor when he looked over at his comrade, angry bite marks peppering his skin. There were several dead creatures in the room with him, strewn all over the floor. Some wore soldiers' garb, others scrubs and lab coats. The bold mercenary paused. He knew this man was done for. That was clear as day even if they somehow could take on the myriad of corpses about to bust into the room and get to Carl. He had so many bites that it wasn't a matter of if he would change into one of those things. But when? Damn, that doesn't look good, Kemp murmured. No Name took a deep breath. Despite knowing he was boned, he wanted Carl to know that he wasn't forgotten. He gently tapped the glass to get his attention. The wounded mercenary's head whipped around, and his wild eyes widened at the sight of his comrades on the other side of the glass. "'Commander?' he asked, 
his voice hoarse. Hey, No Name smiled, motioning to the room. Looks like you got your hands full there. Carl fell into a strained grin and a shrug. Yeah, had a bit of a situation, he replied. I'm handling it, though. I can see that, the bold mercenary replied, and inclined his head towards the body strewn about. Good to see you haven't lost a step, even with a broken ankle. Carl smirked, the expression lessened a little by his pallid face, and sweat glistening on his brow. I've been shot four times, Commander, he drawled. This ankle affects me about as much as a paper-cut wound. I knew there was a reason I always had you in my squad, No Name said with a chuckle. Kemp swallowed hard beside him, grinning to keep up the charade. You mean it wasn't just because of the pretty face? Carl raised a hand to motion to his mug, and then immediately slapped it back against the bowing door. Kemp clenched his jaw, gripping his gun tightly. Well, that too, No Name replied, and the men shared a choked laugh. He took a deep breath. So, we're going to come and get you out of there. Carl shook his head. No, I don't think so, Commander, he replied. I... I don't really know what's going on, but I saw enough to know those bites aren't great for my long-term health prospects. Not fond of the idea of leaving you alone in there, No Name admitted. Carl inclined his head to the door. Don't worry, Commander. I have some friends to keep me company, he said offering another forced smile. They're persistent and pushy, but they really want to be with me. No Name shot him a look, a stern look that conveyed that this wasn't going to end well for him. But the mercenary wasn't stupid. Understanding pulled in his eyes, veiling the unadulterated terror beneath. Well, Carl, you listen, and you listen good, No Name said firmly. Our boys are working hard to secure this base. And when they do, they'll come and get you out of here. His subordinate smiled, giving him a nod. I'll be seeing you, Commander, he said. No name swallowed hard. If they did see each other again, Carl would be one of those running corpses hungry for flesh. He nodded. Kemp gave the man a nod and a curt wave, tearing his eyes away from their soon-to-be-dead friend quickly. I thought he'd be safe or dead he murmured as they moved away from the infirmary, towards the front of the building. Not this in-between. It still feels like we're leaving him behind, but we can't save him anyway. No Name nodded in agreement, not able to voice his agreement, but feeling the same way. Nothing about this felt right, but this felt extra wrong despite being the only thing to do. As the duo trudged by the front office, no Name glanced over at the security monitor. He quickly located the infirmary, and his jaw clenched at the sight of the doors Carl had been holding, standing wide open. The mob of zombies gone. Come on, he said with a sigh. We shouldn't be too much further from the helicopter pad. Chapter 7 Theo still moved a bit slowly but was at least a bit more mobile than he had been right after the wreck. Jason kept watch, paying special attention to the house next door, where the neighbor and his family had been overwhelmed. In the last ten minutes or so, a few zombies had wandered out of the hanging front door and vanished into the darkness. It didn't seem as if anyone inside had survived, or at least, if they had, they weren't coming to secure the door. Theo groaned behind him, and he turned his attention from the window to his boss. You okay, sir? he asked. Yeah, just a little sore, but I'll be fine, Theo grunted. He inclined his head towards Jason's wound. How about you? he asked. Jason offered a small smile. Well, I don't have an overwhelming desire to bite off a chunk of your flesh, if that's what you're asking, he drawled. Theo chuckled, running a hand through his hair. That's a relief, he replied. You good to move? Jason asked. His boss nodded, straightening his shoulders. Yeah, not going to be doing any wind sprints any time soon, but I can move, he said. Good, Jason said with a sharp nod. I'm going to go get us a ride. You just be ready to move when I get back. Theo's gaze steeled. Whoa now, 
he said firmly. I can help. Jason held up his arm, waving his bite in front of his face. I already have an expiration date, he reminded him. Let me do the dangerous stuff. You have too many people relying on you. Thank you, Schmidt, Theo said, swallowing hard. My pleasure, sir, Jason replied, and readied his weapons before walking over to the front door and peering out at the neighbor's house. It was about a thirty-yard dash to the open door, and he hoped it wasn't too crowded inside. He hadn't yet seen the neighbor come back out, so that was at least one corpse that would still be in there. Jason took a deep breath and steeled himself, and then made a mad dash for the other house. One zombie staggered into his path, and he jammed his knife into its eye socket to avoid making too much noise. He reached the front door and darted inside, closing the door behind him as quietly as he could. He didn't want any of the ghouls outside to make it in, blocking his escape. His only mission was to get keys to get Theo out of there, if it was the last thing he did, and it likely would be. His hopes that the house would be empty were dashed as two zombies snarled at him from the living room. He dove to one side, leaping over the kitchen island, and lashed back to stab into one's eye socket. He missed, embedding the knife into the top of its head, and its friend knocked the corpse aside so fast that he didn't get the knife back. Jason grunted and reached up, grabbing a cast iron pan from the rack above, whacking the zombie across the face with it, and sending its head into an unnatural angle. Another corpse moaned from behind him, coming in from another hallway, and he leapt across the island again, this time skidding down the hallway. He swung at another zombie that leapt out in front of him, but his smack with the pan didn't kill it. He needed something sharp and berated himself for not grabbing a butcher knife or something from the kitchen as he dove into the living room. There was a fireplace there, and he snatched up a poker from the rack of tools next to it, sending the rest clattering to the floor, stabbing forward just in time to catch a zombie in the eye socket. He ripped it free and then swung it like a baseball bat at another approaching ghoul, this one with its head bent to the side, the first one he'd hit with the pan. That left one more zombie loose in the house, but he had to find the keys. He knew he had an expiry date, and that more bites wouldn't really make a difference in the grand scheme of things, but he still needed to survive long enough to get Theo the keys. He tightened his grip on the poker, and ran to the lounge area of the living room that was beside the foyer at the front of the house. There was a desk there, and he rummaged around, finally finding a set of keys in one of the drawers. He turned around to dart into the foyer, but a zombie launched into his vision. He caught a flash of long blonde hair before his collarbone exploded in pain, and he shoved as hard as he could, but couldn't dislodge the teeth. The poker clattered to the floor as he wrestled with the monster, slamming it against the wall, and then getting his arm underneath its neck. He finally managed to tear it free of him, the resounding tearing sound making bile rise in his throat when he realized it was his own flesh peeled from his body. The zombie chewed happily as it fell back onto the couch, and he saw Red snatching up the poker and bringing it down on the ghoul's face over and over again like a club. When the zombie wasn't moving anywhere, wasn't chewing, just a limp corpse with a liquefied head splattered all over the white couch. He threw the weapon to the ground and backed away, chest heaving. The whole front of him felt wet, hot, and his head swam. She'd got him badly. Theo, need to get to Theo, he thought, and swung back around to face the desk. He grabbed the keys he dropped with slimy fingers and staggered back into the foyer. There was a discarded towel on the floor where the foyer hardwood turned into kitchen linoleum, and he snatched it up, pressing it against his wound as he staggered to the front door. He drew his sidearm, despite not wanting to make any noise. If he could just throw the keys to Theo and then make noise to attract any would-be attackers, he could go out knowing he'd done his all. Thankfully, there were no more zombies in the yard when he opened the door. Theo burst out of the house as he returned. Jesus, man, they got you good, he blurted. Yeah, afraid they did, sir, Jason huffed, tossing him the keys. 
Afraid they did. Before he realized what his body was doing, he was sitting on the grass, and he blinked a few times, lowering his hands to fist in the lawn. It's been an honor working for you, sir, he said, his head swimming. The honor is all mine, son, Theo replied. Pretty sure I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Jason swallowed hard, the motion like daggers in his throat. Will you promise me something, sir? he asked hoarsely. Absolutely, Theo replied. If this thing is as bad as they say, and you have to rebuild... Jason's voice sounded far away, as if he weren't in his body any more. Will you name something after me? His boss nodded emphatically. Of course, he said. You want a school or courthouse or something? Jason chuckled, his head steadying enough that he could smirk up at the man looming over him. I was thinking more of a strip club, but I'll take what I can get, he drawled. They shared a laugh, the moment of levity bringing him back to himself a little bit. The towel in his hand squished, sopping with wet crimson, and he tossed it around. Blood spurt from his neck and he gagged. You should go, sir, he rasped. Theo drew his handgun, aiming it at Jason, but the wounded man waved him off. It'll attract attention, he said. I'll take care of it. Theo nodded, lowering his weapon and not saying anything else, rushing off to the car. As he hopped in and sped off, Jason swallowed hard again, drawing his own gun. He'd done his job. He'd kept his boss safe and alive as long as he could. And now it was time for him to complete his final mission and make sure he didn't add yet another zombie to the hordes that would be taking over the city, or the country, or the world. He put the barrel to his temple as more blood waterfalled down the front of him, closing his eyes and imagining his comrades partying it up in a strip club named after their buddy Schmidt. Then he pulled the trigger. Chapter 8 Mosley and Charlie got their group ready to go, the civilians armed with blunt objects, save for Danny, who held a butcher knife. Desmond stumbled as he sidled up next to his friends, hissing from the wound in his leg, and barely catching himself on the counter behind him before falling to the ground. May maybe Desmond should stay here? Nancy piped up hoarsely. He's hurt pretty bad. Mosley sneered at her. Everybody goes, sweetheart, he drawled. She blinked rapidly at him. But I... He cut her off by cocking his handgun and pointing it at Desmond's head. The only way any of you are staying here is if you have a bullet in your head, he declared, and then stared at his victim. Do you want that? He asked with an air of finality. Because she seems okay with that. No, sir. I'll be fine. Desmond hissed. Are you sure? Mosley asked, leaning in a bit. What about you? He glanced at the others. You think he's going to be able to keep up? Nancy let out a strangled noise, eyes swelling with tears. Yes, yes, she insisted thickly. He'll make it. Mosley smirked and lowered the gun, holstering it and throwing her a wink as she quivered beneath his stare. Desmond ground his teeth together, and Mosley ran his tongue over his teeth. It is truly a miracle to have that kind of recovery, he drawled, sarcasm evident in his tone. Now come on, we got work to do. He led them to the door, a few zombies milling about outside, most of them having wandered off in search of other prey. He stopped about ten yards before the opening, and Charlie followed suit. The civilian stopped behind them, but Mosley scoffed and inclined his head. What are you waiting for? he snapped. Get it done. Danny huffed. You got the guns, man. Just shoot em, he said. You're about to go into battle with me, Mosley snarled. And I need to know what I'm working with. So unless you want to, ahem, stay behind, I suggest you take care of them. Danny clenched his jaw so hard his teeth squeaked, but the mercenary just tapped his sidearm, daring the civilian to defy him again. 
Come on, let's do this, Danny huffed, and led the group to the door. Nancy trembled, eyes darting every which way as she gripped her bat, and Ed brushed past her to get to the door. I'm a big old boy. I think I can brace the door enough for you to strike it down, he said. Desmond limped forward. What about the one behind it? he asked. Danny tightened his grip on his butcher knife. I'll handle him, he promised. Ed got into position by the door, grabbing the handle. The creatures outside grew agitated at the noise, apparently spotting movement behind the door's window. He counted down from three and then turned the knob, immediately bracing the door against his foot as the ghouls tried to force their way inside. Desmond immediately swung down with a bat, catching the creature on top of the head. It wasn't hard enough to kill it, though, just dent its skull a bit. Come on, put your back into it, boy, Mosley bellowed, tone mocking, and Charlie laughed from beside him. Desmond let out a scream and cracked the zombie's skull. It slumped to the ground, immediately replaced by another corpse. Danny stepped forward, jamming his knife into its face. The zombie convulsed for a moment and then dropped to the floor. Danny leaned down and drew the knife out of its head and turned back to Mosley with a sneer. So, what do you think? he demanded. We pass your little test? The mercenary gave a little golf clap. Bravo! Not bad at all, he said, rolling his eyes. Do that about fifty more times, and you might just live through the night. Danny's eyes widened, and Nancy muffled a noise of fear behind her hand as the mercenaries led them out the door. The villas were a few hundred yards to the south on the water, which was where most of the zombies were. The group moved the way, but a half-dozen ghouls leapt into their path. Jane screamed, and Danny shoved her out of the way, stabbing a zombie in the face. She hit the ground hard, and a ghoul leapt on her, biting into her calf. Her shrieks intensified as she tried kicking it off of her, unsuccessfully. Danny lunged down and stabbed that one in the head too, and then whipped around to defend the fallen and bitten woman, knife raised. Mosley shook his head, clucking his tongue at the display. Five minutes in, and another was already bit and useless, as Desmond, Nancy, and Ed struggled to fight the other four ghouls. It was clear that they weren't going to get anywhere, so Mosley motioned for Charlie to join the fight. The mercenary leapt into the fray, using only his knife to keep everything quiet, and managed to take out two while the others struggled with the other two. Nancy managed to bludgeon the last zombie while Desmond held it at bay, and then Danny helped Jane to her feet. She winced and hissed at the pain in her ankle, but only glanced fearfully at Mosley before nodding to Danny that she was okay. The mercenary sneered happy in the knowledge that she knew better than to complain. They moved towards the villas once again, but this time a dozen ghouls emerged from the darkness. Jane screamed, and Mosley grunted, raising his weapon. Charlie followed suit, and they started shooting, only to find that as those ghouls fell, more were behind them. Go! Mosley barked, and the civilians raced towards the villas. Desmond and Jane slowed the pack, and the mercenaries pushed through them to get to the villas. Zombies came at them from both sides, snarls and snaps and moans echoing from the darkness. Charlie darted up onto one of the porches first, blowing into the door of the house seconds before Mosley. He turned around to shove the door shut, but the others were hot on his heels despite their injuries and bustled in, throwing themselves back against the door once they were clear. Mosley fired through the gap in the door, hitting whatever he could, but there were too many out there, and they couldn't get the door closed. The windows! he barked, motioning wildly. Charlie went one way, and Danny went another, the two of them opening windows on either side of the door to stab and fire into the horde. Need some help over here? Danny cried and Mosley swung around into the living room to fire at the window, where five zombies were crammed into the frame, swinging so wildly with their arms that Danny couldn't get close enough to stab them in the head. When they were all dead, they effectively barricaded the window. 
Jane's scream pierced the air, and she practically flew into the room, followed by Nancy and a ghoul. The couch! Mosley barked as he shot the zombie, and he and Danny shoved the couch against the door to the front hallway. He didn't know where the others were, or what was happening on Charlie's side, but apparently these civilians couldn't even hold a damn door. Ghouls clustered against the back of the couch, and Mosley braced his foot against the bottom of it, motioning for the women to hold the bottom. Danny came up beside him and tried to stab at the zombies like whack-a-mole, managing to take out a few, but most of them succumbing to bullets. As Mosley reloaded, he realized one of the trampled bodies in the hallway was Ed's, a few ghouls still munching on his chest and arms. He managed to glance over the decaying heads to where Charlie had barricaded the other room with something similar, firing into the hallway. There was a clatter from somewhere in the house, sounding like the kitchen, and then Danny darted for the back of the room, throwing himself into the door there as ghouls pounded on it from the other side. They got around, he yelled, and then more shouts from elsewhere in the house. Charlie emerged into the hallway, wading through the corpses, Desmond behind him, and then a zombie dove out of the room they'd been in, latching onto Desmond's shoulder. He screamed in agony, and Charlie whipped around, putting a bullet in the zombie's head, and narrowly missing the living man. The mercenary reloaded, as Mosley regarded him. Flank him in the kitchen, he instructed, and backed up from the couch. Getting heavy, guys, Danny huffed from the door and Nancy jumped up to go help him. Mosley hauled Jane to her feet, shoving her after Charlie and a bleeding Desmond. An arm wriggled out from the door, and Danny shrank away from it. Gunshots echoed as Mosley fired through the gap in the door, and Charlie got them from behind in the kitchen. Finally the threat was neutralized, and they all stood there, the kitchen door hanging open, catching their breaths. Somebody check on Ed, Danny huffed. Jane approached the hallway, and then a scream tore its way out of her throat as his body started to move. Oh God, he's not dead, she shrieked. Mosley walked over casually, raising his gun and putting a bullet between Ed's eyes, just as he began to sit up. Jane leapt away from him, screaming again, and Danny stepped forward, holding up his knife. Charlie stepped forward raising his gun with murder in his eyes. No, no, it's all right there, Charlie, Mosley drawled, pushing down on the barrel. Put your gun down. If this boy thinks he can take me on, then let him have his shot. Danny snarled. You talk a lot of shit for a man I'm about to beat down, he said. Mosley casually walked into the kitchen, opening up a drawer and pulling out a teaspoon. He turned around with a flourish and brandished it the same way that his opponent did with his knife. Just so we're clear, he said firmly, if this is indeed the route you want to take, I will knock you on your ass. Then while you're on the ground wondering what freight train just ran you over, I will use this spoon to dig out your eyeball before feeding it to you like you're a goddamn toddler. He zoomed the spoon through the air making an engine noise with his lips. Open wide, it's the airplane coming in for a landing. He clucked his tongue. Me saying that to you will be the last thing you ever hear, outside of you chewing your own fucking eyeball, of course. Danny wavered, gulping hard, his bravado quickly fading from his eyes at the descriptive prospect of his own mutilation. Mosley's arm dropped to his side. So, if you're not going to take your shot, can we keep moving? he asked with a shrug. There's more of those things out there. But what about Ed? Jane demanded. You just shot him. Mosley waved her off. He was coming back as one of them, he said flippantly. Those bites are infectious as hell. Jane and Desmond stiffened. Oh yeah, you two are fucked, Mosley said gleefully, throwing them a snare. The only reason I haven't put you down like old Ed there is because you're still alive and kicking. Now I don't know when you're going to turn, but rest assured that when you do, I'll do you solid and put you out of your misery. A sob wrenched its way from Jane's throat, and Desmond put an arm around her, pulling her against his chest. No need to be so rude about it, 
he said, glaring at the mercenary. Oh, I'm sorry. Does this look like a sugar-coating type of situation? Mosley snapped, throwing up a hand. You're going to die, sooner rather than later, and you're going to be a threat to everyone around you. Pretty sure there isn't a polite way to put that. He rolled his eyes. Now if you're done yapping, we got work to do. He turned and strode over to Charlie, who was still standing guard at the front door. What's the situation? he asked. Got another batch of those things down the way, his subordinate replied. Even with all our noise, they didn't want to pull themselves away from a house. Mosley pursed his lips. Survivor? he asked. Maybe at one time, Charlie mused. But I would think that with the noise we made, that they would have tried to make contact. Flick their lights on and off, open the curtains, anything. Nothing? Mosley asked. His subordinate shook his head. Not a damn thing, he said. All right, listen up, Mosley drawled, turning back to the group. We got another house to clear out. About twenty of those things are outside, and they are very eager to get inside that house. So I'm going to give you an option, he grinned. You want to fight them outside or inside? The civilians all glanced at each other. Jane wiping furiously at her eyes, still wrapped in Desmond's arms. How would we get inside? Danny asked. Mosley motioned for them to follow him to the back patio. He pointed to a small walkway along the water that led to the house in question. It was about fifty yards long, with only a couple of zombies in the way. Right there, he said. Run down there, get inside, take them out, and then whatever's inside. Danny sighed heavily. Guessing you aren't helping? he asked. We'll be backing you up, Mosley replied with a shrug. Danny shook his head. This is bullshit, he muttered under his breath. Mosley's eyes blazed and he cupped a hand around his ear. I'm sorry, did you say something, boy? he asked, leaning in. The civilian bit his tongue and shook his head. Mosley sneered. Didn't think so, he snapped. Now get moving. They moved out of the villa, heading down the walkway and managing to take down the few zombies littering the path. Mosley and Charlie remained at a safe distance, waiting for them to get into the back of the building. There were three zombies inside, and Danny managed to take one out himself, while Desmond and Jane beat back the other two, so Nancy could brain them with her bat. The mercenaries watched, staying back as the civilians approached the front door. Desmond and Danny were first to the door, and Danny raised his knife, ready to try the door trick once again. Jane and Nancy got behind Desmond, ready to help him brace the door. As soon as he opened it, the force caused them all to groan. They may have been able to hold it at the beginning of the day, but now they were exhausted and dying and under duress. Danny managed to take out two ghouls before Desmond dropped to a knee, hissing, his eyes rolling back and his face pale. Three zombies immediately squirmed through, diving down onto him. Nancy and Jane screamed, but continued to try to hold the door while Danny stabbed the three zombies as they feasted. The women weren't strong enough to hold, however, and soon it flung open, zombies pouring inside. Mosley and Charlie stepped up then, opening fire with their rifles, ripping the zombies to shreds as Desmond crawled away from the front door towards the others. Danny continued to fight, stabbing at any stray ghouls that made it out of the front hall, leaping back any time a bullet got too close. Once the dust settled and the bodies were nothing but a pile of flesh in the front, the mercenaries turned to the four exhausted civilians. Mosley walked up to Desmond, aiming his handgun unceremoniously and pulling the trigger to put him down. He then turned to the rest of the group. Which one of you bitches got bit? he demanded. Jane's eyes grew wide as the other two stepped away from her. No, please, please. Mosley cut her off with the bullet to the face, and as her body crumpled to the floor, Danny let out a strangled cry. You motherfucker! he yelled. Mosley aimed the gun at him with a sneer. That's not very polite, boy, he drawled. 
Danny gripped the knife tightly, as if he were going to rush him, but then ultimately decided against it. Come on, Bar should be getting here soon, Mosley said to Charlie, and turned away from the civilians. As soon as his back faced him, Danny rushed him. But the mercenary was fast, whipping around and smacking his arm away, easily snatching the knife and jamming it into the civilian's gut. Now what in the world made you think you could sneak up on me like that? He asked, voice low and menacing. Huh? He twisted the knife, and Danny cried out in pain. I'm a highly trained ass-kicking machine. And you thought you could, what, stab me in the back? He shoved his fist deeper, burying the blade farther into Danny's gut, causing blood to spurt from the dying man's mouth. You're lucky we're in a hurry, because if not, I'd stay and have a little fun with you. He shoved the man to the floor, and then aimed his handgun at his head, shooting him in the forehead. Better to be safe than sorry, Mosley said, as casually as if he were talking about the weather. Nancy let out a strangled sob, and the mercenary immediately swung the barrel of his gun in her direction. She squeaked and dropped her weapon, raising her hands above her head as tears streamed down her face in a waterfall. He tongued his cheek for a moment, and then raked his eyes down her body, eventually lowering his weapon. He definitely wished he wasn't in a hurry for this one, too. Secure her, and let's go, he finally said. Charlie took the shaken woman's bicep, keeping his gun firmly in his other hand, and half-dragging her outside after his superior. They headed back towards the community center, silent save for Nancy's gasping cries, reaching it at about the same time Theo pulled up in a sedan. The mercenary leader got out of the car, gun in hand. Is the area secure? he asked in a no-nonsense tone, looking around. Yes, sir. Got a neighborhood half a click that way, Mosley replied, jerking his thumb over his shoulder. But so far haven't had any trouble from them. Theo nodded sharply. Good, he replied, and regarded the quivering woman next to Charlie. Any survivors outside of this one? This is the last woman standing, Mosley replied, shooting her a leer. Nancy's mouth opened and closed, but no sound came out. She winced at Charlie's grip on her arm, attempting to twist a little, but hissing as he jerked it upwards, lifting her onto her tiptoes. Get her inside, and then I want you to find suitable transportation for a couple of fire teams, Theo continued. Mosley raised an eyebrow. We got help coming? he asked. No name is on the base, securing transport, Theo replied with a nod. His subordinate cocked his head. What are we doing once they get here? he asked. Theo raised his chin. We're securing the bridge to the island and making this place ours, he declared, and Mosley's chest soared with excitement. This was it. Everything he could have asked for. He'd joined QXR because he was tired of following the rules, following the law. Now there was no law except for what they made of it. If they weren't fleeing with the military, or joining any kind of other forces, that meant this island would belong to them. Essentially, this whole part of the world would belong to them. They would be the law. A grin grew on Mosley's face. This apocalypse was the best thing to ever happen to him. Chapter 9 no Name and Kemp made their way across the base. Gunfire continued to go off in the distance, and as they got closer to the helicopter pad, they could hear the engines going and blades twirling. They took up positions beside a building, looking across the main strip to the road. There was one helicopter left, and the pilot was inside. Guess that's our ride, Kemp said. No Name nodded. Let's go catch it then he urged, and the duo broke from cover. As soon as they started running, a pack of zombies came out from the other side, but it was clear that the pilot was unaware of the threat. No Name raised his gun, and Kemp followed suit, the two of them firing wildly into the pack of corpses. 
The pilot started to take off, but Ghouls latched onto the back of the vehicle, forcing him to set it back down. It was a transport chopper, with a giant open door on the side, and the zombies easily made it inside. Gunfire went off as the pilot fought the ghouls, and No Name's heart sank, saying a silent prayer to urge their rescuer to stay safe. When they reached the chopper, No Name motioned for Kemp to take the far side so he could flank them. The bold mercenary leapt into the air, grabbing the bar above the door with his free hand, and swinging into the chopper, boots first. He struck a zombie in the chest, sending it hurtling into its brethren. Kemp set to work firing with precision behind them, catching them in the back of the skull as they fell to the ground, and No Name fired down, blowing out the foreheads of the ones trying to scramble back up to him. Once the threat was neutralized, Kemp climbed inside as No Name turned to the pilot. You all right, man? he asked, looking over the miraculously unharmed soldier. Yeah, I think I'm good, the pilot replied, though his eyes were wide and shaken. We're going to need your help, No Name demanded. The pilot nodded. As long as you're going to the rendezvous point, I'm happy to take you, he replied. The bold mercenary shook his head. We're going to Harbor Town on Hilton Head Island, he said. I'm sorry, sir, the pilot replied, but I have strict orders to only go to the rendezvous. No Name pointed out of the chopper. Do you see what's going on out here? he demanded. This is the end of everything. The military is evacuating on American soil. That alone should tell you just how bad this is. Now we need your help so that we can protect people, because we're not cutting and running. The pilot hesitated, clenching his jaw, and No Name could see his resolve quaking. So he went in for the kill. We just need a drop off, he promised. After that you can go wherever you want, but helping us out is going to save lives. Before the pilot could answer, gunfire popped off behind them as Kemp began shooting again. Take off! Take off! He screamed from behind No Name. Take off! The pilot quickly complied, rising from the ground as quickly as he could, and saving them from the horde piling on the helipad below. No Name looked down, seeing about fifty ghouls converging on what would have been their location. All right, the pilot finally conceded. What do you need me to do? No Name held up a finger and smacked his communicator. Jackie, do you copy? he asked. The line opened and a torrent of gunfire cracked through the speaker. I'm here, Jackie yelled. Is there a place to land over there? No Name asked. Negative, came the reply. We're still fighting off these things. They just keep coming. No Name leaned over to the pilot. You ever landed on a hangar before? he asked. The soldier shook his head. No, he replied, but I've hovered over one so people can get on. That'll work, No Name replied, clapping him on the shoulder and then resuming the communicator. Jackie, I need you to get the fire teams onto the roof. The roof? came the incredulous reply. Yeah, and do it now, No Name instructed. We're coming in hot. They're on their way, sir, Jackie replied. The chopper flew over the base, the sun finally peeking over the horizon to illuminate the carnage. There were bodies everywhere, hordes roaming around, clamoring to get into the buildings that may or may not have survivors inside. It looked like every apocalypse movie no name had ever seen, and if intel was to be believed, that's exactly what it was. When the hangar came into view, it was an all-out war. QXR had set up a hasty fire line made out of spare metal and dead bodies. Constant muzzle flashes peppered the dark cover, bullets spraying into the sea of zombies constantly coming at them. The whole area in front of the hangar was dead corpses, for at least a hundred yards. Jesus Christ, the pilot breathed. No Name spotted his men standing on top of the hangar and tapped the soldier on the shoulder, pointing to it. The chopper banked over and hovered over the roof. Kemp and No Name leaned out, helping eight men clamber inside, which put the helicopter to capacity. The pilot rose the craft into the air again, and No Name left Kemp to debrief everyone as he leaned back into the cockpit. You know where you're going? the bold mercenary asked. 
The pilot tilted his head back and forth. I know where Hilton Head is, but that's about it, he admitted. Southwest tip of the island, no name instructed. The pilot gave him a thumbs up, and the bold mercenary nodded, taking the time to survey the landscape. The sun fully broke the horizon, and the damage from the chaos of the night came into view in stark contrast. As they soared over Buford, no name was surprised to only see a few fires and a few car wrecks with zombies running amuck. Guess the base was so bad because everyone was awake and outside, he thought to himself, shaking his head. Not going to be long before it hits like that everywhere. He imagined how many of those houses were just trapped zombies, family members waking up to screams as another who had been ill suddenly had a taste for human flesh. Or any that didn't wake up to monsters in their home, making coffee and heading out for work only to be attacked on the way to the car. They flew over Hilton Head, and it was the same thing. Only minor incidents could be seen, especially on the bridge where it almost looked like business as usual. It was only when they started getting closer to the southern part of the island where there were signs of damage. A few cars were wrecked on the road, some emergency vehicles moving about, and even some figures running around. As they grew closer, no name pointed to the landing zone in the parking lot by the community centre. As soon as the chopper landed, the men disembarked, and no name leaned over the pilot's shoulder. I need you to wait here for a moment, he said. I imagine my boss will want a word. The pilot nodded, turning as the bold mercenary stepped aside. As if on cue, Theo Atkinson emerged from the community centre, with Mosley and Charlie in tow. He greeted his men, and then left them to be delegated by Mosley, before climbing up into the chopper. I appreciate you giving my boys a lift, he said. It's my pleasure, sir, the pilot replied politely. Your man made a convincing case about saving lives, so I was glad to help. Theo nodded thoughtfully. Do you know what's going on, son? he asked. I know enough to know it's really bad, the soldier replied. The QXR leader's eyes hardened. Well, no matter how bad you think it is, the situation is far worse than that, he declared. Now, do you know who I am? I imagine you're a shot caller with QXR Group, the pilot replied with a small shrug. Theo raised an eyebrow. I'm not a shot caller. I'm the shot caller, he declared. I'm Theo Atkinson, and this is my company. And as it so happens, I have an opening for a helicopter pilot. I don't know, sir, the pilot said slowly, swallowing hard. My CO. Your CO, assuming he's still alive, is running away from the fight, Theo cut in firmly, abandoning the people he swore to protect. Now, I don't fault them at all, as they're just following orders, but you, you have a choice. You can tuck your tail between your legs and run away with them, or you can stay and help us secure this island against what is coming. The pilot chewed his lip, eyes darting back and forth nervously. And if it'll put your mind at ease, I have a direct line to General Harper on the Joint Chiefs. Theo continued, raising a hand. One call from me, and you're in the clear of any punishment the military might hand down. And if you're still not convinced, we have plenty of beachfront properties that will be in need of tenants when we get this place locked down. Let me assure you, I pay more than enough for you to make that rent. The pilot nodded slowly. Okay, sir, I'll help you out, he said, taking a deep breath. For the people, he paused. And the beachfront. Theo grinned and clapped him on the shoulder. That's my boy, he said. Now hang out here for a minute, and I'll tell you where you're going next. I have something to attend to first. Yes, sir, the pilot replied, raising his hand for a salute, but then thinking better of it and lowering his hand. No name led Theo from the chopper and joined Mosley. You two, get your teams up to the bridge and secure it, Theo instructed. Do whatever needs to be done to seal it off. The bold mercenary stiffened. What about civilians? he asked. Do a blood type check, and if they have A-type blood you put them down immediately, Theo replied. If they don't, and you think they can be useful in a fight, hold them there until you get further instruction. Mosley raised an eyebrow, a malicious glint in his eye. And if they're not useful? he asked. 
Theo pursed his lips for a moment. I'll figure out something for that too, he replied, waving them off. Now move, time is not on our side. Both men nodded and gathered their fire teams rushing to waiting vehicles and loading up. They sped off the few miles to the bridge at the northern part of the island, No Name's blood rushing in his ears. Chapter 10 The drive to the bridge was relatively uneventful. Kemp looked out the passenger side window as No Name drove. He watched the destruction, zombies running free everywhere. This is not going to be fun to clear out he murmured under his breath. Wouldn't be the first time we've had to clear things door to door, No Name quipped. Kemp shook his head. First time where half the population wants you dead, he replied. True, the bold mercenary said, and then smirked. Most of the time that number is closer to ninety percent. Kemp chuckled, happy for the bit of levity. He tore his eyes away from the chaos and watched the cars ahead to try to focus on the right now, instead of what may or may not be to come. Just up ahead of them, a vehicle spun out of control, smacking into a telephone pole. Kemp swallowed hard, and as they drove by he looked over to see the driver slumped over the airbag, bleeding profusely. There was nobody else in the vehicle, and then he spotted the angry red bite mark on the man's arm that hung out the window. He swallowed hard, a bite victim trying to escape their fate. Or had they succumbed to such a bad fever that they'd been unable to drive? He wondered if there'd been enough head trauma for the man to stay dead, or if he'd reanimate. Forever stuck in the car until someone came close enough for him to feed on. When they reached the bridge, they found it mostly empty, with only a couple of cars coming onto the island. Before they could go past, Mosley swerved in front of them, getting out and aiming his weapon to force them out of their vehicles. What the hell is he doing? Kemp breathed, as No Name squealed to a stop. Get lost! Mosley barked at the civilians, who took off running down the road on foot. Mosley, what are you doing? No Name demanded, and Kemp kept pace with him as he moved. He'd always enjoyed serving under No Name, despite his mysterious past. He had a good moral compass, and Kemp counted his lucky stars that he'd been stuck with this man in the apocalypse, as opposed to a slime ball like Mosley. I'm securing this bridge, you nameless freak, the slime ball said with a sneer. And we need cars to do that, unless you got a better idea. No name sighed. Can't say that I do, he replied. Charlie, get those cars up to the edge of the bridge and find me more to work with. Mosley instructed. Yes, sir, Charlie replied, motioning to a few more of their men from the fire team, who hopped into a car and sped off down the bridge, cutting off another vehicle and commandeering it as well. No name turned to his fire team. Take the SUV, he instructed. I'm pretty sure there's a neighborhood just off of the bridge. Get what we need and get back here. The men nodded and bustled back into the vehicle, leaving the trio of men alone. So, how bad's the base? Mosley asked, as casually as if he were discussing the weather. Heard the military hightailed it out of here. No Name nodded. You heard correctly, he said, his voice sounding tired. And it's a mess, a couple thousand dead at least. Mosley let out a low whistle. Man, I'm glad I'm not in that shit show anymore, he drawled. Loving this independent contractor lifestyle. Kemp swallowed a bad taste in his mouth. But before No Name could reply, a sedan sped up to them, horn honking loudly. Mosley raised his weapon, and the car skidded to a stop. A wild-eyed woman leaning out the driver's side window. Please, please, I have to help my daughter, she blubbered, face wet with tears. What's the problem? No Name said brow furrowing in concern. She's sick, the woman sobbed. She's really sick. No Name's brow furrowed. Ma'am, I'm going to need you to get out of the car, he said firmly. What? she cried. But I need a hospital. The bold mercenary took a deep breath, raising his own weapon. Out of the car now, ma'am, 
he instructed. He inclined his head to Kemp as she slowly got out, raising her hands, entire body quivering. He followed his orders, approaching her and offering a gentle smile. Please, what's going on? she gasped. Ma'am, are you bitten? Kemp asked. What? she stammered. No, I'm not bitten. Why would I be bitten? Bitten from what? Mosley and No Name approached the back seat as Kemp kept the woman busy. As the bold mercenary's shoulders tightened, Kemp leaned over a touch as No Name opened the back door, violent coughing and retching echoing from the car. No Name glanced back at Kemp and shook his head silently. Ma'am, what blood type is your daughter? Kemp asked gently. What? she asked, wrapping her arms around her midsection tightly. I don't understand. Please, Kemp said, injecting as much compassion into his voice as possible. It's important. The woman gasped another sob and then shook her head. A positive, she replied. Mosley started to raise his gun, but No Name pushed the barrel down quickly. The men had a stare down, and Kemp struggled not to bristle, so he didn't alarm the woman. Kemp, why don't you take this woman to one of our vehicles? No Name asked. What? She whipped around to face him. No, I'm not leaving my daughter. Kemp grabbed her arm before she could launch herself towards the car, dragging her away from his co-workers. This was what he'd been dreading. This was the part of this job that was going to be the hardest. Not everyone would understand. I'm sorry, but this is the only way. He heard No Name's rumbling voice, and then a gunshot. The woman screamed, melting against Kemp in anguish as he held her. She clawed and smacked at him, but he secured her arms and just held her. He was certain that Mosley wouldn't hesitate to shoot her if she went running at them, and seeing her daughter's dead body wouldn't help her grief and rage any. Her shrieks were unintelligible, but he could pick out how could you, and my baby girl, and his heart clenched. Nobody is going to be spared from this, he thought bitterly, living or dead. He half dragged the woman to a vehicle driving up with yet another group of mercenaries to help with the fight. He sat her in the back seat as she dissolved into a ball of tears, curling up and hugging her knees to her chest. Kemp turned away just as No Name stepped away from the child he'd just killed, shaking his head. He walked to the nearest car and drove it up to the line. Kemp took a deep breath, trying to shove away his grim thoughts so he could do his job. There was a lot of death and sadness ahead for them, but at least they had something that most people didn't. A fighting chance. The End